Hello, I'm Camila Escalante, host of the Canada Final Speaker Series, a show where we introduce you to critical perspectives of people challenging Canadian foreign policy. And today we have Yves Engler. He's an author of uh, numerous books, and he's also an activist who uh, many people have come to know uh, through different actions that he's participated in. And I'm going to let you actually give us a little bit more of an extensive introduction. But first of all, thank you so much for joining us on the Canada Files. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. So just going along with how uh, Aiden has structured some of our previous interviews for the Canada Files, we want to hear a little bit about your early years in activism. What kind of got you into the work you do now? So start us off with that. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, my parents uh, are, you know, left wing background, but I was like a hockey focused uh person for many into late my teens I played uh, junior junior a hockey so I was uh, very much in a bit of a different cultural kind of milieu I started getting a sort of politicized when I went to uh, uh, a Capilano college in uh, in Vancouver I guess when I was uh, 19 after uh, ending playing uh, hockey and then I went to Concordia uh, in Montreal to go to university and it was the um, the most politicized campus in the uh, in the country, and um, very left wing student unions, and there was the uh, Free Trade Area of the Americas protest uh, in uh, April of two thousand one. Uh, I started school, I guess, in September of two thousand at Concordia, and I kind of got involved in the mobilization, the, I guess, the movement against corporate globalization, and. Uh, just sort of got involved in uh, student activism at the university and kind of one thing led to another. And then I was uh, elected to the uh, Concordia Student Union in uh, 2002. And uh, we were the fourth year in a row of, of like left wing, or I guess radical left wing uh, uh, slates uh, in the CSU. And um, it was very pro-Palestinian uh, campus and the Israel lobby was really trying to undermine that. And as part of that, they tried to have a Benjamin Netanyahu speak at the university and Netanyahu was stopped from speaking and, and, uh, just huge amount of backlash that came down against the student union, against student activism. And, um, so yeah, I was sort of in the middle of that as a elected, uh, uh, vice president of the student union. And, um, that was a very tumultuous year, a year of just one political kind of development after another. And of course, there was the U.S. invasion of Iraq in uh, March of uh, 2003. So big mobilizations in, in Montreal against uh, against uh, that. And I played a small role in, in some of that, uh, those mobilizations. And then it was really when it came to focusing on Canadian foreign policy, it was really uh, the overthrow of the elected government in Haiti in 2004. And I had the uh, good fortune to do, uh, well, actually, my, my uncle had given me uh, the Black Jacobins uh, by um, uh, C.L.R. James, uh, the history of, of the Haitian Revolution and, and uh, Toussaint Louverture. And, uh, and then I took a history of Haiti course at Concordia. And so I had a little bit of like background knowledge to, uh, to Haiti and where this coup happens in 2004. And I basically was stunned by how involved Canada was. I, I you know, I, I, even though I've been politicized and involved in the anti-corporate globalization movement and, you know, against the Iraq war, I kind of still had this idea of like benevolent Canada, peacekeeping Canada, all that kind of stuff. And to see how deeply involved the Canada was in the coup in Haiti was really eye-opening. And then I was involved in the setting up the Canada Haiti Action Network uh, and Haiti Action Montreal and really campaigned against Canada's role in Haiti for a couple of years and the worst of the killing uh, sort of subsided. I, I basically um, began a big uh, uh, sort of research project of, you know, if Canada was so bad, its policy was so bad in Haiti, uh, you know, every facet of the Canadian state was involved in the coup in Haiti in 2004, from the police to the NGOs, to the military, to the diplomats, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, if it was so bad in Haiti, then, you know, what was it elsewhere? And I basically just started researching Canadian foreign policy and I published the Black Book of Canadian Foreign Policy. And at the time, I, I knew already that there was need to cover other subjects more in depth, like the history of Canada's um, uh, support for Zionism, its you know, dispossession of Palestinians. And uh, yeah, and I sort of just got a trajectory of um, of challenging uh, uh, Canadian foreign policy. And uh, the more you, the more you look at the matter, the more you realize that it's um, you know fundamentally driven by empire, driven by corporations. And it's, uh, you know, it needs to be challenged and it needs to be uh, restrained. Um, um, and so, yeah, that's kind of a quick synopsis of my uh, political background. I should have said in the introduction that you are, of course, I think joining us from Montreal and that's where you're from. And like you said, you went to university there. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, just a quick sum up of the books you've written? You've written 12 books, um, the latest. Stand on guard for whom? A people's history of Canadian military. But tell us about all of the books that you've written. Yeah, I mean, they're mostly about Canadian foreign policy and they are, you know, a couple critical account of Harper's time, critical account of Trudeau's time, a Canada and Africa book that goes quite an in-depth history of Canada's role in, in the subjugation of the African continent. And, um, you know, that looks at everything from the missionaries to the Canadians that conquered the continent to the Canadians who were colonial governors in different British colonies uh, up until, you know, the Canadian mining companies that are you know, pillaging the continent today. Um, also a history of Canadian support for Zionism. So yeah, the, the theme in the theme, if there is a simple theme in, in my books on Canadian foreign policy is that, is that uh, the, the mythology is just, you know, the idea of benevolent Canadian foreign policy is just, is just simply mythology. It's not based in fact whatsoever. And, and, um, and I also have a book on the propaganda system in Canadian foreign policy, sort of trying to explain a bit about why the public is so confused about, about Canada's role in the world. And also, uh, which is slightly connected to it, uh, the, you know, how the left or the dominant left institutions from the NDP to, um, to unions and, and other uh, um, groups associated with, usually associated with the left, how they've uh, often gone along with this uh, pro-empire, pro-corporate uh, uh, foreign policy. Um, so yeah, the books are just really a, 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 an effort to poke at the mythology and of course to try to, to the extent that books can, uh, they're usually historical, but to the extent they can, you know, have some impact on, on ongoing um, uh unjust uh, uh, foreign policy um, uh, measures. Yeah, so there's a number of things I'd like to speak to you about. I think your work has really uh, been interesting for me because a part of me wants to do a lot of what you do actually, which is criticize uh, and look, look over uh, Canadian foreign policy, do investigations and things like that. Uh, but of course, my and my, you know, area of focus is Latin America, and it always has been. Obviously, there's some links there, but this gives me a really great opportunity to talk about some things I've been wanting to talk about. So I was most recently in Canada in the month of June, and I've, of course, been living largely in Bolivia recently. And then the during a lot of the campaign uh, for the re-election of Lula, I was following uh, the Workers' Party campaign in Brazil. And so it, it had been a while since I had been to Canada. And so in Toronto, um, one of the things that I notice that I've kind of heard friends talk about uh, in different parts of the global north is, of course, how normalized it is for there to be Ukrainian flags on people's uh, homes and their cars and businesses. I would say it would be quite unacceptable for someone uh, to to prop up a Russian flag on their on their front porch, at least where uh, where I live in Toronto. And so, you know, I think we've just seen a little bit of the normalization of this sort of support for Ukraine. And though I know people would like to frame it as support for the Ukrainian people and um, whatever it is that, 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 that they think that they're supporting there. The, the, the fact is that the Canadian government is sending 
very large amounts on a frequent basis, as all other uh, NATO governments are as well, to Ukraine. They're sending weapons. Obviously, Canada has its own uh, arms industry, uh, but they're also sending money and what they call aid and things like that. I think this is something that you've touched on before. And so tell us a little bit, you know, what the scope of that has been, how long uh, Canada has been involved in Ukraine, and of course, you know, in particular, this current administration. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, the, you know, Canadian government has been um, a ho very hawkish on the NATO proxy war. And that doesn't just begin um, with Trudeau, uh, though Trudeau has, you know, been been that way, of course, the Harper government before it played an important role in the ouster of, uh, of Viktor Yanukovych and, and backing the Maidan protests. And, and you know, if you go back before that, you find that the Kane government uh, was was really strong supporter of the, uh, the previous Liberal government, the Paul Martin government of, um, of the Orange Revolution and, and uh, basically been backing quite clearly um, anti-Russian forces within Ukraine since the end of the, uh, the Soviet Union. And in fact, before the end of the Soviet Union, of course, like Christian Freeland, uh, when she went to that went there in the 19, late 1980s, the current um, uh, deputy uh, uh, prime minister and finance minister, uh, Christian Freeland was, was, uh, was, you know, sort of trying to promote Ukrainian nationalism as part of, you know, trying to, um, undermine the, the the Soviet Union, um, and it goes back, you know, even decades and decades before that. So, so they they've been very hawkish, um, and they've been very hawkish. I think for lots of different reasons. One is that Canada has been a, you know, was a founding one of the three members that countries that founded NATO: Britain, Canada, and the U.S. And um, also because there's a big uh, Ukrainian uh, Canadian. Uh, population in Canada, and that's uh, you know the early Ukrainian Canadian community was you know very left wing and and um, you know socialistic uh, 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 pro communist, uh, but then in the 1940s the Canadian government uh, basically did all they could to undermine the more sort of left wing Ukrainian Canadian uh, community and and propped up the more right wing and and oftentimes even um, you know pro Nazi uh, uh, during World War II, uh, forces within the Ukrainian community. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, I think also Canada's distance, you know, like there's not, Canada doesn't have major economic relations with, with um, Russia. So, you know, sanctioning and, and breaking relations doesn't cost, like it doesn't have that sort of economic impact it has in Germany where you, you know, have lots of, you know, um, energy uh, purchases and stuff like that. Um, so from a Canadian government perspective, it's fairly limited uh, uh, cost and um, and they're, you know, really sort of hawkish on NATO, hawkish on, uh, they have this sort of organized uh, hard right uh, Ukrainian Canadian community. Obviously, Canada's amongst the most pro-US uh, US empire countries in the world. And so that trickles down into the public, uh, you know, perception of you, the media, all of the politicians in the House of Commons, no, no one criticizes the government's perspective. Um, basically, no criticism in the dominant media, you know, like, maybe over the past 18 months, 19 months, uh, since Russia's invasion, uh, which I, I should say, I, 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 you know, I disagree with Russia's invasion, I do think it's a con contravention of international law. Um, but there's basically no one in the dominant media that, that, um, that you know questions Canada giving over two billion dollars in weapons uh, to uh, to fight Russia. Uh, that questions um, you know Canada's role in in uh, pushing NATO expansion, Canada's role in undermining op the um, the Minsk II peace agreement. Right, that's part of what the Canada's military training of Ukraine beginning in 2015 was about. Was that um, we were basically supporting, a, we were in a proxy war with Russia since at least 2015, since April 2015, when Canada is training the Ukrainian military that's, you know, fighting against um, uh, separatist forces in in, uh, in the Donbass. And um, so the Canadian government, like I said, helped overthrow Yanukovych. Uh, the Canadian government has been, you know, basically said almost nothing about 
the U.S. ripping up uh, different nuclear treaties that are that are um, that are viewed as you know threatening uh, to Russia. You know, installing U.S. Uh, weapons systems in Poland and Romania and the like. Um, so, so yeah, that trickles down into the public, and the public is. Interestingly enough, the public, the polling shows that the public is, is you know, very much on board with uh, Ukraine winning, though polling also shows that the public is fairly ambivalent about sending weapons. Uh, uh, that's quite interesting, considering there's no uh, there's no voice in the dominant uh, political discussion that's actually uh, advocating a uh, opposition to Canada sending weapons. Um, but uh, but definitely, I think, the, you know, it's clear that the public is on board. Uh, but that's in large part because the just sort of totally one-sided uh, uh, propaganda kind of uh, uh, coverage. Yeah, absolutely. And so speaking of one-sided propaganda, Canada has really, and, um, as far as I can see, picked up the pace in targeting some of the official U.S. enemy countries. Uh, it's really kind of at the forefront of a lot of the diplomatic footwork. Um, a lot of the different uh, things that the U.S. would rather would rather outsource to another country in terms of leading sanctions, in terms of leading uh, resolution votes in the U.N. General Assembly and other things like that using the multilateral system. And one of those countries is, of course, Iran. And so last week, Canada's foreign global affairs actually announced a new set of sanctions against Iran and did so at the same time as the UK, Australia, and the US. And they do that with um, all countries as well now, that they've kind of just adopted that policy. I think uh, they also have adopted uh, sanctions against Nicaragua at the same time as the United States. And so it really represents a complete adoption, I think, of US foreign policy towards most countries, perhaps not uh, countries like Cuba. Perhaps we should have said that you do this sort of, I don't know if it's uh, weekly, but you do this Canadian foreign policy hour, uh, which is a weekly critical look at Canadian foreign policy. And I was actually listening to one of them and I heard uh, a very uh, particular comment which said that, you know, should Canadians be supporting a particular candidate in the United States? Because it seems as if they just have no control whatsoever as citizens of Canada, nor does the government of Canada have any control over its own foreign policy. And it really just rests on the shoulders of the U.S. political system. And I just think that it's like an absurd um, and just very unfortunate thing uh, that people think that and feel that. Talk to us a little bit about Canada's use of unilateral course of measures and sanctions on a very long list of countries, which of course include uh, Iran and Nicaragua and Venezuela via the Lima cartel, uh, among many others. Yeah, I mean, that is, um, I would say, for the most part, when I'm talking about Canadian foreign policy, the broad patterns have have not shifted a great deal over over 100 years and in, in some ways the question of sanctions and the aggressiveness of canada sanctioning countries is something that is is um, newer and uh, the trudeau government has really ramped up sanctions they brought in the Man magnitsky act back in uh, 2017 and christian freeland was a big pusher in that process and um, and as you mentioned, there's been 14 rounds of sanctions against Iran, Iranian officials over the past uh, year. Uh, and there's, of course, been uh, there was uh, I forget exactly how many rounds, but uh, three or four rounds of sanctions against Venezuelan officials as part of their bid to try to overthrow Venezuela's government. Uh, and uh, Nicaragua, uh, obviously, Russia, there's been uh I don't know what the number of, you know, it's innumerable different uh, uh, sanctions. Now, on um, Friday or Saturday, Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie put out a tweet uh, boasting about the latest round of sanctions against Iran and uh, how aggressive Canadian sanctions have been. I haven't seen, and I haven't really seen anyone prod this, uh, uh, whether this is all, whether the, the Global Affairs Canada uh, believes this is in line with with um, 
international law. Um, there is a good argument to be made that that these sanctions are contrary to international law, and in, obviously international law is not something that's uh, uh, very well uh, defined in the legal sphere, unlike many different domestic uh, legal issues. But but most countries believe that unilateral sanctions are a violation of international law, and and uh, and I believe most uh, international law experts uh, believe that uh, as well. And yet the Kenyan government doesn't, you know, it, it goes on and on about how it's all about the international rules-based order and and the variations. And obviously with Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, they've, they've been talking a lot about uh, the UN charter, but they basically never say whether they believe that these sanctions uh, contravene the UN charter. And, and the media basically doesn't bother uh, pressing them on, on the matter. But, but clearly the Canadian government in recent years uh, has, as part of Washington ratcheting up uh, its sanction measures, it has uh, greatly increased uh, uh, sanctions, international sanctions. One thing I do also want to say about the point you made about, about um, uh, whether we Canadians should get involved in U.S. elections as a way to change Canadian foreign policy because Canadian foreign policy is just U.S. foreign policy. Now, one element in that I, I don't think gets enough attention is, is the contrast, right? Like people often say that Canada follows U.S. foreign policy because it's economically dependent on the U.S. Well, there's obviously a certain truth to that. NAFTA and free trade agreements made Canada and the U.S. Econ economy is very integrated. But the reality is that Mexico actually exports more uh, and has a higher proportion of GDP exports to the U.S. than Canada has. And there's no doubt that Mexican uh, economic relations and dependency on the U.S. influences Mexican foreign policy. I have absolutely no doubt that that influences Mexican foreign policy and Mexican policy in general, even under, under a, you know, an AMLO or more left-wing uh, uh, government. But Mexico's foreign policy is infinitely less... Uh, tied in to U.S. foreign policy, be that, you know, sending, you know, billions of dollars to weapons to Ukraine, be that sending, uh, you know, some naval vessels to patrol the South China Sea or the, the Strait of Taiwan. And, you know, so, so, so the, the question of why Canada is so aligned with U.S. foreign policy can't be just explained by sort of economic relations. It has cultural elements to it. It has historical elements to it. It has racism elements to it. It has um, integration with the British, you know, the two main empires of the past two centuries elements to it. There's many different elements to it. And, and it is ultimately in Canadian, the Canadian public's hand to lessen Canada, we can, you know, it's not something that's like preordained. We can lessen uh, Canada's uh, uh, alignment with the U.S. empire. And there's, there are some indicate, there are some examples where there have been, you know, Canada has been less uh, aligned uh, historically. And it's always been very aligned with U.S. foreign policy, or at least since World War II. Uh, but there's, you know, slightly less, lesser degrees. Um, and so, so yeah, there's, there's, um, there's room for, um uh, for a minimum, there's room for having a less pro-U.S. foreign policy, uh, and that's in Canadian public's hand to uh, to demand. Yeah, absolutely. And so this weekend, of course, um, in Havana was held the G77 plus China, and they actually came out with a final declaration, uh, a joint declaration. Uh, stating that the member countries reiterate their rejection of the imposition of laws and regulations with extra extraterritorial impact and all other forms of coercive economic measures, including unilateral sanctions such as uh, against developing countries. Um, they say that such actions have negative and devastating repercussions on the enjoyment of the most basic human rights, including the right to development. What an important, uh, you know, gathering of these different countries. Of course, you know, they say a lot of the same diplomatic things that we're used to them hearing, but they did have a little bit of a focus on the way in which, you know, the inequality in the world system uh, affects the access to technology, because that, that was kind of the theme of this um, of this meeting. And they specifically, uh, you know, a lot of people, given that this was held in Cuba, 
rejected uh, the decades long blockade, US blockade on Cuba as everyone does every year in the General Assembly. But they went further to say that uh, all of these unilateral coercive measures affect uh, affect these countries very negatively, the population of these countries, and of course their right to development, and the countries on a whole, uh, with the exception of perhaps uh, you know China and Russia, that Canada has sanctioned and is currently uh, sanctioning our countries of the global south. They are developing uh, countries with smaller economies, particularly countries like Nicaragua, which is a very small economy um, and ha which has fought, uh, you know, many battles against U.S. imperialism and is uh, is still being uh, sanctioned by uh, the U.S. allies, but but Canada in particular. So, you know, that's Canada ignoring the rest of the world and having this sort of supremacist attitude. You know, the other way that I think is just absolutely glaring um, and egregious is Canada's position on China. And so tell us a little bit about that. That came into the news in a very big way um, with, uh, with something that took place a couple of years ago with an executive of Huawei. Uh, but just in general, I think this has been in, in large part done with the help of the Canadian media and its sort of demonization of all of these enemy countries, including, as we've said, you know, Russia, Iran and China. So tell us what, what Canada is up to on the China front. Well, well, I think China actually represents a sort of interesting case in Canadian foreign policy because, as I've mentioned, um, there's really two main drivers of Canadian foreign policy. Support for empire, historically British, today U.S., and support for Canadian corporate interests abroad. And on China, there is a bit of a division within the ruling class. There's a fairly substantive segment of the ruling class uh, that basically sees China as everything from a big market to to sell products to to uh, have you know investments or uh, to make profits from profits from in one way or another, and and the they have basically over the past uh, few years lost out to the segment of the Canadian ruling class that is basically we we should align with Washington. And that segment is most obviously seen in, in the Canadian military, in the intelligence agencies, and uh, obviously the arms, uh, the arms uh, manufacturers. And, and, um, and basically in the past uh, three, four years, there's just been an incredible anti-China push, uh, most importantly from, from the Globe and Mail and, uh, and specifically two reporters, Stephen Chase and, and uh, Bob Fife at the Globe and Mail. And, and they have just done kind of a relentless uh, media, mostly just uh, echoing the opinion of the, um, the intelligence agencies, uh, CSIS, uh, Communication Security Establishment, and which is part of the, you know, tied in with the, the NSA and the, and the Five Eyes uh, UK Australia, uh, New Zealand, Canada, uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence network, which is very much a sort of white supremacist uh, uh, Anglosphere um, uh, alliance, and 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 it, yeah, it's just been a sort of a relentless push. And obviously, the the uh, the uh, detainment of uh, Meng Wanzhou, the the the, the uh, executive from uh, Huawei. Uh, was a big part of that, and then China re retaliated by uh, detaining two Canadians, and then that really, you know, facilitated this sort of bad China kind of narrative. Uh, even though, of course, it was Canada that was the the instigator, and this was all following Washington, right? We were detaining her for like a, a total absurdity of of uh, the Americans claiming that uh, her company had uh, her and her company had had. Um, misled a uh, a uh, a bank uh, around sanctions around Iran so it really the US really had nothing should have should have had nothing to do with it but the Americans were claiming that it was a violation of their sanctions and and they claim extraterritoriality that they can you know uh, sanction any second party anywhere in the world um, and so the Canadian, the Trudeau government um, went along with this uh, this uh, American uh, 
um, kind of uh, absurdity around um, uh, the the Huawei executive, and and uh, and so that really led to deteriorating relations. Now, now what we're we've got to the point now, I would say that that there still are very important corporate interests that want to do business with China, but they are uh, they are you know intimidated by the sort of more pro us empire factions of the ruling class and they've mostly gone silent and at this point all of the media is in sort of like an anti china kind of uh, 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 a freak out mode which actually just just saw in a really uh, st- stunning way with david common the cbc reporter who's just done about a 10 day long uh, trip he started off with this uh, a trip aboard a canadian naval vessel that's r- running provocative maneuvers alongside us uh, naval vessel in the in the uh, Taiwan Strait, and then he's just done a whole series of reports from Japan, from the Philippines about how you know everyone hates China and everyone's militarizing, and we have to support the Philippines and the Japanese and as they they take on the uh, the big bad uh, 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 Chinese, um, and so uh, we definitely are moving towards this very uh, intense. Uh, uh, Geopolitical conflict with with uh, with China that obviously is 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 stirred by uh, by uh, imperial forces in Washington, and um, and uh, you know where this is all going to go I don't know I, I think it's just complete uh, madness from you know humanity's perspective uh, this is not um, we we have some major uh, international crises uh, from you know the climate crises to different ec- other ecological crises to massive inequality that that should be far far more um for higher priority than uh than um you know getting into a big uh, geopolitical conflict between the two uh, two most powerful nations in the world but but you know this is where it's going and um um the canadian government is, is increasingly a uh, an, uh, an aggressive proponent of uh, of this kind of uh, uh policy You know, one of the ways that I tend to, I have attempted, I think, uh, to touch on some Canadian topics with Latin America is, of course, trying to look at the ways in which Canada has been involved in the different political processes of Latin America and the Caribbean. Particularly uh, recently, of course, they did play a role in the coup in Peru. They were, you know, right there ready to recognize Janine Añez in 2019 in Bolivia. Canada also obviously hosted uh, the Lima cartel, largely headed by Christia Freeland, uh, when they were trying to overthrow the government of Venezuela. And I know that you've looked at Canada's involvement in Haiti, among other places. One of the things that, I guess, struck me, I went to a political school of formation many years ago in South America. And I was, you know, one of the only Canadians. And uh, people said to me, there are Canadian mining companies in my country. These are comrades from Africa and Asia and all countries of Latin America. Actually, a lot of people said that to me. They said that, oh, one of the things that my organization does, these are organizations of peasants or indigenous people, or leftist political parties or whatever they were who were attending this school with me, they said that one of the things they do is oppose Canadian uh, mining operations where they live in their countries, places like Paraguay or South Africa. You know, this is kind of what the world has come to know of what Canada does in, in terms of, you know, the reason why it has certain relations with certain countries and how it gets involved with the global south. Maybe you can touch a bit on Canada's involvement for a very long time now in Haiti. And also, um, I think I've heard you speak about Canada and Libya, which is in the news now. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, uh, Haiti and Libya, the two things that that connect them is that in both cases, the Canadian government's interventions were based upon a claim to the responsibility to protect, which was a doctrine that the uh, uh, Paul Martin government uh, pushed, tried to get the UN to adopt, and basically said that when there was, you know, massive human rights violations taking place somewhere, it was the responsibility of the international community to intervene over and above considerations of uh, of state sovereignty, and to actually try to try to change international law to to uh, 
adhere to this principle. And they, they use that, Canadian government officials used that, cited the responsibility to protect, to justify uh, invading in 2004 with U.S. and French forces to overthrow the elected government in Haiti. And uh, they helped uh, organize the uh, overthrow of the government 13 months before and something called the Ottawa Initiative on Haiti, and um, where they discussed ousting Aristide, putting Haiti on a UN trusteeship, uh, recreating the Haitian military. That happened basically 13 months later. And then they backed a coup government that killed thousands of people. And um, for the past uh, 20 years, it's been the core group dominated by the U.S., obviously, with Canada as the second major player of foreign ambassadors that have, to a large extent, kind of overseen Haitian affairs. And they have uh, consistently tipped the balance in favor of uh, uh, pro-elite, uh, anti-sovereignty anti, uh, uh, political forces within Haiti. And it's been an absolute complete disaster. And we're seeing uh, the uh, results of the of that policy in with a, just the total social breakdown uh, in in Haitian uh, a life, where you know gangs have now taken a large control of big chunks of Port-au-Prince and big chunks of the country. And um, but the political roots of this are Canada supporting the forces that that you know that basically the Canadian government doesn't want the pro-poor pro-sovereignty uh, forces that were uh, that were organized within the Fami Lavalas movement, within the Fami Lavalas political party, and to a slightly lesser extent, Rene Preval and uh, Rene Preval's uh, uh, presidency after the coup. And, and they've been trying to undermine that. And simultaneously, they, they've supported the the PHTK, this very uh, reactionary uh uh, thuggish uh, uh, political forces that that Michel Martelly uh, represents, and and that those are the forces that have basically been running Haiti into the ground over the past uh, 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 twelve years, and so like you know just actually just today um, a new Canadian ambassador was appointed uh, to Haiti, and it's all over the Haitian media, right? N basically, no Canadian media, no Canadians, and even no you know knew the former uh, Canadian ambassador, uh, Sébastien Carrière, uh, in Haiti, but he was like a really prominent figure in Haiti. I, I stated a couple of times that Sébastien Carrière, the former Canadian ambassador, could go to Global Affairs Canada, and there, you know, maybe 1% of Global Affairs Canada employees would, would even recognize him. But like in Haiti, he's like actually like a, like a big figure because he, cause he cause kind of operates as like sort of a almost like a colonial uh, the governor. That's how much influence Canada has in Haiti. And so, um, you know, it's it's just ignored in the Canadian media or justified in the Canadian media, what, to the extent it is ever recognized, uh, Canadian influence in the country. Um, and, uh, you know, to connect it to, to Libya, in 2011, uh, the, the Canadian government more explicitly, a uh, bunch of top... Uh, former officials, uh, li liberal officials, in the pages of the Ottawa Citizen, in the pages of major papers said, we have to invade Libya, we have to intervene in Libya, you know, to, we have the responsibility to protect. And um, the claim was that Gaddafi was doing a whole series of bad things. Uh, most of those claims have been actually even Amnesty International has disproved, uh, Human Rights Watch, is the sort of Western establishment uh, human rights groups have have um, have you know disproven the claims, everything from the Viagra claims to the mass rape claims to the helicopters shooting protesters claims, um, and and uh, but what we actually have is six months of uh, a NATO war led by a overseen by a Canadian general uh, Charles Bouchard uh, that dropped thousands and thousands of bombs on uh, Libya. And uh, ultimately succeeded in in um, in, in winning and killing uh, Gaddafi and and uh, defeating the uh, Libyan government uh, uh, forces, and and it basically has led to uh, thirteen years of uh, uh, I guess uh, twelve years of uh, of uh, instability, political division, and uh, all sort of social indicators have deteriorated. 
And, uh, and now, of course, we have this horrible tragedy uh, flooding in eastern uh, Libya, in, in Derna. And, 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 you know, this was a major storm. This was a major storm that hit, hit um, Greece. It hit a whole bunch of parts of uh, the Mediterranean. So there's no doubt that this uh, storm, Daniel, was going to uh, lead to, um, uh, you know, have negative consequences in eastern Libya. There's no doubt about it. it dropped huge amounts of water very quickly. But two different uh, political elements uh, led to the just, you know, huge tragedy that's transpired, which is one in that there was very poor ev evacuation. There was contradictory uh, messages put out around uh, uh, calling on the population to, to you know, evacuate and move to higher ground and stuff like that. And, and, and that's in part because of the political divisions in the country. And then the other thing is, is that the two dams, um, which... Uh, hadn't been repaired in in, um, in basically two decades. Uh, everyone knew it was widely uh, known that they were uh, vulnerable uh, to a major, uh, uh, you know, uh, rain or, or water accumulation uh, incident, and um, and they burst and they did led to just a destroyed uh, 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 city. It just you know, obviously people have probably seen the images is that are really just sort of stunning. And what's absolutely remarkable about this uh, is the Canadian media's coverage over the past uh, week, where they have been able to, you know, in one instance, uh, Andrew Chang on CBC, uh, this CBC national uh, uh, reporter, very prominent CBC reporter, when, you know, his coverage of lots of domestic issues, you know, comes across as sort of like a social democrat, you know, pretty humanistic seeming, liberal minded, whatever. He did a 10 and a half minute report that was a context report. And it was, he just literally didn't mention NATO's war. Like he was able to just eliminate the, the most important, uh, most politically salient point for a Canadian audience. This is a Canadian public broadcaster airing to a Canadian audience literally eliminates the fact that a Canadian general led a NATO war, Canadian fighter jets, naval vessels, special forces participated, huge amounts of diplomatic, other you know forms of Canadian support. And just as NATO war just, just, just disappeared. And it's all about, you know, Libyan warfare, inter, inter Libyan uh, uh, warfare, really remark. And he's just one example, but the, the global mail, Jeffrey York, again, fairly, um, one of the better international correspondents within within the Globe Mail, Jeffrey York's story, same thing, just eliminates NATO from from the whole uh, uh, discussion. Just really impressive, impressive uh, uh, omission uh, uh, propaganda, and uh, and it's in part because there's two I think elements. One is it's this Canadian benevolent Canadian mythology, and and to, to talk about Canada having maybe contributed to bad things in Libya. It, it, undermines that mythology. Uh, and of course, we should say that in 2011, it was all the political parties that backed the uh, the war. The Elizabeth May from the Green Party voted against one resolution, House of Commons, uh, opposing it. Only one MP in one of the two resolutions opposed it. Um, but, but and all the media celebrated it, and etc. But the other part, I think, is not just about Libya and Canadian mythology. The other part of it is, is to do actually with Ukraine. And the fact that we've been bombarded with this idea that NATO is this defensive alliance and this, this war is an unprovoked Russian aggression and NATO's expansion and NATO policy in Ukraine and, and the region had nothing to do with Russia's invasion. Again, defensive, defensive, defensive. And so mentioning, you know, NATO violence in Libya undercuts the propaganda that's been going on for two years regarding Ukraine. So someone like uh, Andrew Chang at the CBC or Jeffrey York at the Globe Mail don't even dare mention NATO because it, it's not just about, you know, Canadian benevolent foreign policy mythology, but it's also about the NATO proxy war uh, uh, with, uh, with Ukraine. Yeah, I think it's really important. Uh, the job of looking at the way in which the media is covering all these different things. And maybe we can come back to that. But, um, you know, I believe that Canada has its hands in obviously many situations ac across the globe. But I do think right now in particular, as we've said, it's been doing it's the bidding of the United States and all this sort of diplomatic footwork on particularly the issue of Haiti. And so can you tell us right now, because I think that, you know, they've actually provided more 
um, I would say concrete and material support for, you know, invasion occupation once again, um, and are really playing a, a leading role there. So what, what can people, you know, what should people be looking out for? I know that the left or whatever it is in progressives or whatever people consider themselves to be uh, in Canada are kind of, you know, in shambles and dealing with really difficult uh, conditions, let's say, uh, with inflation and everything else that's happening there. But at some point, I do believe that some sort of campaign should exist, uh, really questioning the way in which Canada treats countries like Haiti and, 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 and their activities there. So tell us a little bit of like, what to look out for. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the most salient political demand of Canada's role in Haiti is Canada out of the core group, right? The core group is just this uh, grouping of foreign ambassadors, uh, U.S., Canada, France, Brazil, uh, U.N. representative, uh, Spain is part of it, it's sort of there's slight variations at different times. And, um, and it basically has all this influence in the country that is you know there's no i mean there's not a a group of the jamaican uh bang uh, bangladeshian uh nicaraguan uh uh mexican uh ambassadors don't have this little group that comes together in ottawa and decide you know puts out press releases and statements on on you know Canadian political affairs and and then has all this and it actually happens also right and so in you know after Jovenel Moïse was assassinated a bit over two years ago the president uh, Ariel Henry the person who's currently in charge who has no the zero um, constitutional legitimacy to to Ariel Henry how he won uh, the the power struggle. There was three different individuals who were making a claim uh, to be the uh, the prime minister, effectively the leader of the country. How he won uh, the power struggle was a tweet by the core group. Literally, it was by you know he he was appointed by tweet, and um, and uh, so this is this is a it's it's a colonial relationship. It's it's also also as many Haitian uh, activists online point out, it's you know, white people, for the most part, in a room making decisions for an overwhelmingly uh, black uh, country, and um, so the core group is a, is a you know an illegitimate form. It, it traces its roots to the Ottawa Initiative on Haiti, the the organ the meeting that the the uh, Chrétien government organized in two thousand three, where they uh, brought together uh, French, U.S. Uh, organization American states officials to discuss Haiti's future where no Haitians were were invited and then, as I mentioned they discussed overthrowing the elected government so so the most clear uh, political demand any movement on Haiti uh, Canada in, in Haiti should be focusing on is is that demand now I have to say very unfortunately things have deteriorated to the point in Haiti that there is the, to me there is no sort of like 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 sort of obvious um uh easy uh, solution so for instance for the past 20 years uh one of the things that i've been criticizing a lot is canada's support for the haitian national police because after the coup we basically militarized the haitian police we brought in these you know uh former military people a military that the, the Aristide government disbanded in in 96 uh, they were, it was a military created by the U S uh, very, uh, violent, uh, human rights, uh, uh, defying, uh, military. And, uh, and of course they overthrew Aristide in, in 1991 and then had a brutal military dictatorship for three years. And, and so the, the Canadian government after the coup of 2004 brought in these former military people into the police and uh, and it was part of the whole like repressive uh, building up the repressive apparatus of the Haitian state after the 2004 coup. Now the situation has deteriorated so much in Haiti that that um, the police, even you know progressive forces in Haiti, don't see the police in in as a negative a light because the the problem of you know gangs has risen to the point where where that you know the police all, all often actually do work with the gangs so that you know that's 
also complicated. And, and ultimately, these are actually political problems that this illegitimate political authority in the country, that's, uh, um, you know, situation is never going to improve without dealing with that issue. Um, but, but, but there, there's just a reality that the, the police seem like the, the lesser of evil in the uh, 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 short term. So that puts um, uh, some of the uh, sort of Haiti solidarity kind of um, uh, political demands in, in, a, in a bit more of a difficult uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, position, but um, that, you know, it just is the reality of things. But yeah, so, so I mean, I, you can't underestimate, like I, most Canadians, even most people on the left, you, that aren't following Haiti, just the extent to Canadian influence in all facets of political life, right? From the money that's spread around to the different civil society groups, to the NGOs, uh, uh, to just, just the fact that Canadian officials have so much influence within the media in Haiti, within the Haitian elite. It, it, like the influence is, is, is substantive. And, and that influence is not <laughs> used as they claim it's to be used it's not used to advance democracy it's not used to overcome inequality it's not it's in very usually used exactly in the opposite it's used to reinforce the most regressive elements of haitian political life the most violent elements of haitian political life, the most um uh wealthy elements of haitian political life and and so um it's um uh there's no sort of like you know easy solution uh, but but certainly uh, the central political problem in Haiti is a lack of sovereignty and the Canadian government is the second most important force in undermining Haitian sovereignty after uh, the U.S. government. Yes. Absolutely. I completely agree. And of course, like you said, they're using these same pretexts to intervene in every country. Human rights, democracy, talking about repression, talking about, uh, you know, the the actions of so-called dictators and authoritarian regimes on uh, civil liberties. And of course, their feminist angle, which is just repulsive. Um, there's a couple of other things I want to just squeeze in here. We'll do one more question that, I, that we had just have to talk about, of course, and then we'll, we'll take it back to Canada, which is, of course, your work on Palestine and uh, Canada's relationship with Israel. I, I reported for Press TV that uh, Naftali Bennett, the former Prime Minister came to Toronto. He had a speaking event. He probably had a lot of other engagements and private meetings. This is something where, of course, Canada pretends to be the good guy and somewhere in between the, the two sides. And of course, we know that's not the case. So tell us a little bit about uh, Canada and, and Palestine. Yeah, well, I mean, Canada has been a uh, major political force in undermining uh, Palestinian rights you know, for a century or more. Uh, and, um, and uh, that continues, I mean, to, you know, um, today, if you look at um, uh, Canada's voting record at the UN, it's one of the most anti-Palestinian. If you look at um, the uh, things like Christian Friedland saying that we're, Canada getting a seat on the U UN Security Council would act as a, quote, asset for Israel, if you look at the Canadians that they uh, that join the Israeli military, uh, get recruited in Canada often in, in violation of the Foreign Enlistment Act. Uh, if you look at uh, the you know trade agreement that the, tr the Trudeau government enhanced, that you know basically accepts Israel's uh, settlements in the in the West Bank, even though officially the Canadian government doesn't. Uh, you know, considers them a violation of international law. Uh, and then um, the most important, uh, though it gets very little attention, is the registered charities in Canada that raise hundreds and hundreds of millions, maybe as much as half a billion dollars a year uh, for projects in Israel. And registered charities, of course, are uh, you get special tax chat uh, status that allows them to... Um, to basically subsidize donations. So if someone gives money to the charity, they get to, you know, a third, a third to 40% of that money back. And 
including uh, you know very uh, wealthy uh, uh, foundations. Um, and those charities don't just support you know they support kind of every kind of different project in Israel from you know hospitals to universities, but they also support all kinds of uh, projects that expand settlement expansion uh, settlements in the West Bank, uh, back the Israeli military, back uh, really openly racist organizations, which in the current rules as of today actually violate Canada Revenue Agency rules. Uh, so, so um, yeah, Canada's support. I mean, the most important historic uh, Canadian contribution to Palestinian dispossession is at the uh, um, UN with the partition plan. And Canada played a very important role in the diplomatic negotiations in 1947 uh, to create the United Nations Special Committee on Palestine to, that sent to the region to come up with a proposal for the British mandate and a Canadian diplomat uh, or Ivan C. Rand, a Supreme Court justice, played an important role in, 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 the, uh, in a very, uh, very pro-Zionist partition plan. And then uh, diplomat uh, Lester Pearson played a very important role in the UN uh, push to, uh, to adopt the partition plan uh, after. And that basically gave the Zionist movement the um, sort of political legitimacy to commit the uh, ethnic cleansing they did in late 1947 and 1948. And, uh, and there were Canadians that were involved in that process, uh, weapon weaponry and stuff. But but so the history of, 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 of Canada is uh, obviously, you know, Zionism benefits from the British Empire. And Canada, as a dominion of the British Empire during a, a large period of this, was very pro-British Empire, and was you know Canadians fought to, with the British in 1917 to conquer uh, uh, Palestine, and and so um, the 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 depth of the uh, backing for Zionism in Canada is is quite uh, extensive. Uh, it flows from uh, imperial forces. It flows from uh, Israel uh, lobby uh, forces. It has a you know his, particularly strong historic Christian Zionist element. Um, there's um, different facets to it, uh, but from a Palestinian perspective, um, Canada has used its power uh, to undermine um, uh, their rights uh, consistently. Yeah, and it's obviously so important that people speak out about this. There is, you know, a bit of a movement in Canada of young Palestinian activists and other voices who have, you know, voiced their objection to Canada's policies. But I guess that kind of brings me to my question on, on the media. But I think just generally the environment in Canada that you're kind of working in is one where um, I got a taste of myself that you stand to get canceled or censored or targeted by Zionist groups, by different sort of interest groups for trying to do activism or journalism on these uh, subjects uh, that happened to me while I was there recently reporting for press TV. And um, it makes it very difficult. And I guess what I've heard from different uh, friends, different people who have long been, been active on, on different issues, of course, Latin America, but also uh, Palestine, but also people who defend um, Iran and that they don't want any sort of uh, Canadian intervention in the country and things like that, is that it's very difficult to do so when you're trying to be a professional, have a job, get work, be in, you know, working in universities and things like that. And it has actually deterred a lot of people from getting involved in those sorts of campaigns or that sort of work because of how much of an impact it can have on your ability to earn and things like that. Can you tell us anything about your experience on that and kind of how that affects people in general? Well, I was expelled from Concordia University uh, in the aftermath of the Netanyahu protests. I never finished my degree. I, I, I had five classes left to get my uh, undergraduate degree. And uh, it was partly uh, because of the pressure from the, the uh, Zionist uh, organizations on the university. And um, uh, so, you know, I've, there's a, um, there's, you know, well-organized uh, 
uh, flack organizations. I mean, you know, literally a group, um, Honest Report in Canada, um, all it does is pressure media outlets that publish anything that may be sort of pro-Palestinian. I mean, they pressure like all the way down the line, like a student newspaper, the Concordia Student Union newspaper or Concordia Student Paper publishes something sort of pro-Palestinian. They all like write a action alert calling on people to email the student paper. Um, so, so there is no doubt that there is an incredible effort to bottle up any sort of criticism. And, and they have a very powerful tool in uh, that process, which is basically to uh, 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 claim anti-Semitism. And so while these groups are very obviously uh, promoting colonialist supremacist ideologies, uh, they claim victimhood. Um, and so, and because they're also aligned with the US empire, you got a mix of, you have a geopolitical force behind you. You have these well uh, uh, financed and organized organizations campaigning specifically on the issue. And then they also have this tool in the back pocket of basically claiming victimhood, even though it's by any objective standards, they're clearly the ones that are like promoting the racism, that are promoting the, the colonialist supremacist ideologies. Uh, they can then, you know, like claim victimhood. So, so it, 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 it is um, a very effective, uh, there are, you know, innumerable examples of individuals who have been, uh, you know, had careers destroyed or, or undermined or, and, and obviously um, the more you try to move up the, the power structure, be that, you know, official politics, be that in academia, be that in the media sphere, be that if you are viewed as, you know, um, uh, pro-Palestinian, uh, they will do what they can to try to, you know, undermine that. Um, uh, I'm somebody who's kind of like more at the margins of, uh, of, uh, of political life. So, you know, for the most part over the past, uh, couple of decades, uh, the pro-Israel, uh, lobby has sort of, uh, I think they've, you know, it's not worth, it's, it's an error to sort of go at me because it's, um, there's not really an obvious, uh, place of, uh, of leverage. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, it's, uh, there's no doubt that the, uh, the ability to, uh, whip backlash, um, is, I think there's sort of a unique, uh, power with, uh, that when it comes to, uh, Palestine solidarity. It's all connected now to, um, the space that we're allowed to be able to reject Canada's policy towards Russia and Ukraine. Uh, the space that's available to be able to criticize anything the government does in the, you know, the mainstream media, the newspapers and broadcast, but also in alternative media. I think it has become very difficult. People are very aware of the lynching. And um, so it hinders our ability to publish. But the result, I think, is a certain kind of mass censorship. Uh, sometimes it's self-censorship. But this is very characteristic of Canada. I don't think that it exists to this extent in the different countries I've lived in and reported in in Latin America. And I would go as far to say that it's not as bad in the U.S. So um, I'm going to give you the last word. Tell us, you know, give us a little bit about, you know, what you think the media's role has been in all of this. Unfortunately, I have a lot of different things I'd like to ask you about uh, Canada domestically. But the media's role in, uh, you know, attacking uh, the, these official enemies on the one hand, also sort of concealing the issues that real Canadians are dealing with on a day to day basis, um, not in any way standing up for the different people and communities that are affected by this neoliberal government and its policies. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think the media, uh, the media is biased towards power across the board. There's just no doubt about it. You know, to take an example um, that's really, uh, you know, sort of at the heart of a lot of concern, political concern right now, the in, uh, housing inaffordability. Uh, the media's coverage of that, you know, they'll talk about housing and inaffordability, but they won't, they won't, you know, they'll... They, it's sort of like somewhat mysterious. The whole thing's fairly mysterious. It's not like, you know, housing is 
I mean, <laughs> you can just build more housing. The, the government can just build more housing. The government has previously was building for decades, was building, uh, you know, large numbers of housing, the federal government. I mean, probably still wasn't even enough at that time, but they basically stopped doing that in the, in the mid nineties. And that has led to, that's one of the important factors and led to a bigger problem with housing and affordability. Now the media coverage of that um, is, you know, makes it mysterious, doesn't sort of say, Hey, you know, we can just mobilize public resources to build housing. It's not like we have lots of public land. We have the materials. We have people who have the skills. It's, you know, this isn't, this isn't, this isn't complicated. Um, it may be politically complicated. It's not like logistically complicated. Um, but, but, but in the dominant media, there'll be some discussion of that. There's some degree of like actual debate on the issue. It's totally slanted towards power. It's totally slanted towards capitalist interests and the sort of main maintenance of the, of the sort of current order. Uh, but there's some degree of debate, uh, that's not the case on foreign policy. On foreign policy, the range of debate is just so stunningly uh, 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 limited, and and the you know which means to it would, and on top of that is and it's partly interconnected with it is that these issues are often very far from people's you know day to day lives and they're they're what they're thinking about right so the, the the media's ability to lie to people is even greater right they can lie on domestic issues and they do endlessly they omit things and they you know uh, and that has obviously has an impact and it's successful but you have some sort of like grounding right if you you know if you've been working the minimum wage you got a friend working the minimum wage the claim that like the world's going to come collapsing down if you add 2 or 3 dollars to the minimum wage it just doesn't really you know ring doesn't it's not believable, but but if you say that the Canadian military is just trying to help the the the, the children of uh, of Pauvre Prince, somebody who's never been to Pauvre Prince, never been to Haiti, uh, all they have to like rely on is what the media is saying, right? And so the ability to distort things becomes that much greater on international issues, and and so um, the the effect of all this is that it's just the media they're their subservience uh, to power is just so uh, extreme. And basically they follow what Ottawa and Washington and the, you know, big mining companies, uh, the think tanks, the military funded, the corporate funded think tanks, what they, what they believe. And, and so um, the media battle on, on foreign policy is, you know, even more important than the than the media battle on all kinds of domestic issues, where, where it's also important. Uh, but the but the media um, bias is just um, is just stunning. It is stunning. Uh, I'm actually writing about this right now. I'm writing a response to a story that I heard on NPR, of course, with regards to Nicaragua, um, and it. It is the case that they're able to say these things because so many people haven't actually been to these countries and they've only heard certain campaigns by, you know, by their own governments and by these Western human rights organizations. And so for me, I would say that, you know, but, but I would still say that in Canada, we have some of the most fogged vision, some of the most far reaching censorship and a severe environment of suppression um, and, you know, inability for people to express their thoughts freely, certainly, uh, you know, in the form of us not being able to publish or say certain things on the airwaves, but also, I think just in general, in public space, it becomes more and more difficult. But we'll have to save it all for another conversation. Thank you so much for being with us on the Canada Files, uh, Eves Engler. Uh, I'm actually going to read a little bit of your bio that I didn't read in the beginning, but You've been dubbed Canada's version of Noam Chomsky by Georgia Strait, one of the most important voices of the Canadian left, Briar Patch. Patch. Sorry, it's a Canadian outlet, of course. Um, so if anyone's not Canadian, they might not be familiar. Of course, uh, the Globe and Mail said in, that you're in the mold of IF Stone, part of that rare but glowing group of social critics unafraid to confront Canada's self-satisfied myths Quill Inquire, Rabble calls you ever insightful, 
And Counterpunch says you're a Chomsky styled iconoclast. And Ottawa citizen left leftist gadfly. And so we can find your work at evesengler.com. You are the author of 12 books. The most recent to be published is Stand on Guard for Whom? A People's History of the Canadian Military. And you're joining us from Montreal. So thank you so much for, for being with us on the Canada Files. Thanks a, a lot for uh, having me on.